Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to services to entire businesses. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. Today, we're going to talk about the next big shift in society, moving along faster than ever before, electric cars and self-driving cars. Good morning, D. Is your electric car car all charged up and ready to go out and work for you today? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Sad to say I'm still on a uh, internal combustion engine. I'm looking forward to the future, though. I think it'll be a big, big change. Yeah, that's like the big talk right now is the idea that you can buy an electric car. It'll have these autonomous features in the future. And then you can literally send out your car for the day. And it can kind of like Uber around or Lyft around, pick up passengers, earn you money, drive back, and then you just charge it and clean it at night. I mean, what do you think about that? That sounds pretty awesome, right? I think it does. And I think it's it's kind of the model for where automation will potentially take us in the future. The only concern is that if, if a company looks at this and says like, okay, well, this is now a money-making asset, not a depreciating liability, then why would we sell this? Why don't we just like keep it in-house and then we make it available for people to use it? So- It'll be interesting to see how that goes. I think the model is so strong that as far as uh, car ownership, especially in this country, that it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for people to get away from it. I, I really feel like if somebody were to, were to ask me, you know, Demetrius, what is the most transformative technology in the world right now? I would say that it's probably going to be um, self-driving vehicles. And the biggest reason for that is it is can completely change the capacity for distribution within our economy. We know for sure that these self-driving cars are going to free up congestion. It's going to make it uh, take fewer vehicles on the road. It's going to make everything safer. But it's also going to make it much easier to, to ship products. It's going to make it much faster, more reliable it's just going to allow the system to handle more distribution. And if you look at things historically, well, this is where things get really exciting for me. If you look at things historically, every time you had a major increase in the capacity of the economic system to deliver products and services. So looking at the steam engine, looking at the, at the, uh, at trains, looking at airlines, looking or um, aircraft or uh, the uh, internet, also, every single time you had one of those systems that increased the capacity, you had a major economic boom that followed it. And that's because uh, the the size of the economy is directly related to how many products you can produce, distribute, and users can consume. So by raising the limiters on how much product can be distributed, especially perishable products like food, we could see massive economic growth as, as a result of it. This could have echoes through every element of our culture. Yeah, but this is that big debate area, right? Because right now, I think if I read it correctly, the number one job for a male in the United States is a truck driver. And <clears throat> that will drastically affect that particular segment, right? Yes. Unless they somehow are part of the process and we're just not aware of what that part is going to be right now. So I look at it and I go, okay, if you're going to have self-driving trucks everywhere, does that mean you're going to have to have like stations where they, you know, are being repaired? So like people who are truck drivers right now will have to be focusing more on repair and maintenance. You know, what do you think is going to happen in that segment? Because that worries me a little bit, but at the same time, I'm also very excited about the technology. Well, this is it is it is worrisome for sure, right? This is the big problem that we, that automation in general presents, and people have been talking about this for quite some time. This is not new, but as automation gets better, as AI gets better at handling, especially non-skilled work, you're going to see a lot of that that non-skilled labor going over to machines, and so you're still going to have people who are who are fleet managers, people who are supervising the AI to make sure that everything's happening properly. You're probably going to see the form factor in a lot of these vehicles change. They might not all be huge semi trucks. You might see, you know, fleets of smaller vehicles um, going out because then they can, especially at the last mile, they can distribute much more easily and take up less space on the road. They're, like if if a small vehicle the size of like a motorcycle hits something else, it causes much less damage than if it's a large truck. There's going to be huge change. 
but this ultimately is why um, why universal basic income is, and to some extent, considered to be a necessary requirement for this type of a future because work, especially for un, unskilled work, not to say there isn't some skill, uh, definitely some skill involved with uh, with driving large vehicles around. It's going to be need to be replaced by something, and in general, the the means of production um, from an economic standpoint is going to be somewhat decoupled from human labor. What are we as a society going to do about that? I'm not entirely sure, but there's a lot of people talking about what what will need to happen. So I've actually seen quite a few innovations uh, in this space for the last the last mile area that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So with the long haul trucking, like obviously um, Tesla and some of the other big companies, they're focusing on that, right? Producing these large trucks, put them on the highway. Uh, no one needs to be in the vehicle, or maybe there's someone is in the vehicle, but they're doing other things. But the vehicle drives itself and goes to these transfer stations and drops off goods and services. And then you have this last mile. So I've seen a couple different ways in which people are trying to approach it, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it because you know we talked about some of this stuff years ago, and some of it actually has come true um, already. So first off, small neighborhoods and cities, you're starting to see these tiny little almost like Mars Rover like vehicles that will drive up and down the street and then they'll stop in front of your house. It'll have, let's say your groceries in it. And then it'll send you a text message and let you know that the vehicle is sitting outside. You walk downstairs, the vehicle's right there. You know, say you came out of your condo or something like that. Let's say in San Francisco, the top pops open, you grab your groceries, go back upstairs. The little little rover vehicle takes off and goes back to its base station where more goods can be uh, placed inside of it. The second one that we're seeing now, which is <clears throat> a little more controversial and also kind of super cool, but um, is uh, drone delivery. Mm-hmm. So drones flying overhead, landing in your backyard, dropping off things that you ordered, that kind of stuff. And then the other one, which seems to be the one that Uber's kind of moving into is like, how do you deliver food to people's homes using the Uber platform, you know, Mm -hmm. or the Lyft platform, right? You already have all of these drivers out taking people from point A to point B. They can also stop at a restaurant, pick up some food and deliver that food to someone's house. So when you think about these different technologies and, and ideas that we're currently seeing here in California, especially in San Francisco, which one do you think has the the greatest likelihood of being successful? Well, I I think that uh, number one, I think that a lot of the gig economy is just going to go away because so much of what they they do is can be automated away, and there's a huge financial incentive for these companies like Uber and Lyft and DoorDash to automate the that element of of the uh, of the supply chain out of it. Right, so people cost money. Drivers are actually pretty underpaid for for the time commitment and the amount of work that they're doing, and uh, Uber and Lyft they they are not profitable. And the only way for them to be so is for them to reduce their costs and get to automation. So, the, so among the different technologies you mentioned, they really have different applications, and it, and it's really dependent on context. So for for aerial drone delivery, for example, right. Where those have the biggest impact is in rural areas. And the reason why is because you have to cross uh, a much larger expanse of, of space, larger area to cover, and uh, you might have uh, less of a road network in order to get there. They, those roads might have might have inconsistent paving, might have some dirt roads here and there. You might have be routed around mountains in order to get there. It is much, much, much more efficient to just go as the crow flies and get to that that product directly to that to that customer um, through an aerial drone delivery than it than it would be using surface streets. That is less important when you're talking about a city, especially a city with uh, pretty good road coverage where they're not ha- heavily congested. And even if they are heavily congested, with the right vehicle form factor, you can get around that. Right? If you have something that's along the lines of a of a motorcycle type form factor, then it can cut through traffic without causing too much problems. Obviously, you have to be careful about you know causing accidents because people don't see motorcycles and and the AI has to be has to be very careful and safe. 
but they can they can use the uh, surface roads in order to provide those deliveries or the little robot like you were talking about like the pizza delivery drones that are out there uh, and people are testing that now you don't have to clutter up the airspace in order to provide deliveries so that is a from a from a contextual standpoint makes much more sense to have those unmanned ground vehicles out there doing that and then when it comes to transportation the human driver approach is probably going to go away. I think that's what Lyft and Uber are. That's their ultimate goal is to get to the point where they can, they try to get the technology from Waymo using some relatively unsavory means. But I think their strategy now is to try to hold on, try to stem the bleeding and to build a bridge to a future where they can license this technology from Tesla and Waymo and what other, whatever other companies develop this so that they can they can replace their driver workforce with self-driving vehicles. Yeah, I mean that's essentially what we're what we're reading, that's essentially what we're kind of hearing, you know, here in the valley and the one thing that keeps coming up is when when is that going to happen? And you know, for the most part, I think everyone thought this was going to happen 5 years ago. I mean, there were so many articles about like self-driving cars are here. And now with the electric vehicle, it's like, you don't need gas, you know, you just, you could charge it, it'll go out, it'll do its job, all that kind of stuff. And it didn't really happen. They're being tested in certain areas and it's, Mm -hmm. it's functional, but it's a very difficult technology to work out. And of course we want to have it working properly. But there's some other really interesting news that came out in 2020, which I want to talk about since we are here in California. So in 2020, we learned from Governor Gavin Newsom that there was a goal that by 2035, we would be no longer selling new gas-powered vehicles. And basically, the executive order, it's it's an executive order, uh, directs the state to require that by 2035, all new cars and passenger trucks sold in California be zero emission vehicles. Transportation currently accounts for more than 50% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a big step forward for California. I mean, California kind of leads leads the way when it comes to green initiatives. And, you know, it's where, you know, Tesla was born. It's where all these different electric car companies were born. I feel like what they're basically saying is, is that the the environment comes first which it should because you know we have a lot of issues with global warming and things like that mm-hmm. but second what it's basically saying is is electric cars are here to stay for sure and that it looks like the future will only be electric cars um except for you know people who who buy gasoline cars for you know nostalgia purposes or just you know just want to kind of have one in their uh in their home i mean is that kind of what you're getting from it as well what Governor Newsom is doing, and it, it would be a little bit less, what's the word? I guess fragile, uh, if it actually came through the legislature rather than, than an executive order, because it, that's that's usually um, a lot of times how these kinds of moves are are really made in a way that's going to going to stand the test of time. But this is probably not going to be heavily challenged, just because the rest of the world is going in this direction. Um, this is definitely going to be the the case in. Lots of Asia, especially China, probably Singapore, Japan, um, lots of Europe also, because they want to get to these uh, zero emission standards and also get away from fossil fuels because it provides way too much uh, geopolitical power to countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia. This ultimately will be kind of the global standard. And the reality is um, all of the car makers – both uh, here in California, like Tesla, and over in Michigan, they want to sell their vehicles internationally. So if if they want to continue to have those access to those international markets, they're going to have to meet those standards. So in the in the grand scheme of things, it's not very controversial. Uh, Twenty thirty five, I think, might be a little bit a um, little bit ambitious, but it also wouldn't be surprise me if. You know, U.S. automakers are playing catch up when we get to that point. We get to 2035 yeah. and, and, you know, all the German and Asian automakers are already zero emission and we're, we're just catching up because we like our legacy vehicles. That's true. And, you know, the other thing that comes to mind when I think about this is, wow, we're going to need a lot of charging infrastructure. Mm-hmm. We're going to need battery swap locations. 
you know, you know, there's kind of a lot that needs to happen that I'm super excited about because I think it's going to be really neat. But I wanted to share one anecdotal piece of information. So I have a really good friend who we both know, um, and he had recently uh, called me to catch up and see how things are going and mentioned that he had just recently purchased um, a Tesla for his family. Now, in the past, he has never owned any electric vehicle or anything like that. And the first thing that I did is I said, what do you think? Like, tell me, give me your feedback. Like, this is the first time you've ever owned an electric vehicle and and you're now you're driving it every day. What are your thoughts? Like, user experience. And he was like, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Now, he has the skills to um, set up a charging station and all that kind of stuff in his garage. Mm -hmm. So he was able to kind of get that all set up so that he just drives a vehicle in and then, you know, has the battery connector and kind of connects it up and all that kind of cool stuff that you that you can do now. But he absolutely loves it. And he said, if you look at the range on them now, the range is by far superior to the way it was 10 years ago. And you can definitely do all the things that you need to do in a given day without having to charge your vehicle, you know, driving to work, dropping kids off at school, you know, doing, uh, activities in the evening, all that kind of stuff, come home and just plug it in. And he said, it's so cool. And also the other side of it is you don't have to stop at gas stations anymore, which for me, that, that moment when you're like, oh, I'm low on gas and you have to go to a gas station or you're cold or you're tired or you just don't want to do it, yeah. right? Getting that off my plate sounds awesome. I do not own an electric vehicle, but I'm definitely like looking into them now. Have you run across any experiences like that? Like if you had a chance to talk to any friends or anyone who has purchased an electric vehicle in the last year? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we're living in Silicon Valley. You know quite a f- few people who own electric vehicles, and, and, and most of them are going to be Teslas. And you talk to them, you know, what's it like? And you go down to the showrooms and you take a look. But realistically, like if you think back, I mean, you and I have worked on vehicles before, and we know what a frustrating experience that can be from a UX perspective because there is looking at the traditional vehicle experience, which hasn't changed that much to this day. There's so much low hanging fruit for what can be improved within you know standard vehicle cockpit, right? There's the the idea that we're just now getting to connected cars. It, it just seems like such a missed opportunity. It, it's I don't know what is taking them so long. The design of you know dash panels and the climate control systems and you know the driving systems like cruise control, everything just seems so Stone Age. To be honest, I look at the Tesla stuff and I think this is a step forward. I can absolutely see room for improvement within, um, you know, interface uh, elements. And obviously there's some features that sh- that still need to be integrated and, and they haven't fully delivered on yet. But it is kind of like, th- this is a classic example, kind of innovator's dilemma within, within the automotive industry where things, you know, worked the way they were and there was no real incentive in order to improve that. Uh, there wasn't a competitor out there who were disrupting things and forcing them to innovate and improve. So you still kind of got stuck with like these analog radio systems as your entertainment, as your entertainment system. And then maybe you can have like a, a DVD player or something in there, but it's just been, it's, it's just been ancient. There was a, a great anecdote that we did a while back. You know, we worked on the, the turn by turn navigation systems when they were first being developed, but we also started uh, a few years after that, started taking a look at how people were using in car versus on, on your phone navigation systems. And we saw all these people who had the navigation systems in their cars, but they weren't using them. They would use their phones. And the reason, one of the big reasons was that the, uh, the car navigation systems weren't automatically updating that you had to like get a, update cd from the manufacturer that could cost a hundred dollars or more and then manually update your your car's gps and it was absolutely ridiculous so everybody was just using the free gps on their phone instead and it's to me that was emblematic of how much detroit and and the automotive industry in general has just let the world move around them yeah i remember when that was happening I remember uh, we went to Radio Shack. If anyone remembers Radio Shack, um, it was a it was a little tiny electronic store. Um, they were sprinkled all throughout California, and we used to call them the Hack Shacks because they had like everything you needed in order to 
uh, as a maker in order to create stuff, build stuff and all that. And I was really big into that when I was younger. And I went over there and I bought a couple of these GPS units. I bought one for myself, one for my dad. And I remember we put them in the car and we went somewhere and there was no map. And I was like, what do you mean there's no map? Like what's going on? And it was because they had redone a street in San Francisco, but it never got repopulated. So I had to like get that CD and download it and update it and everything. And at the time, uh, we didn't have smartphones yet. The iPhone wasn't, hadn't Mm -hmm. come out yet, but like two years later, the iPhone comes out and it's like, oh yeah, the maps are automatically downloaded and and updated regularly. And I'm like, wow, like this should have happened a long time ago. But I did want to give one little side story that I thought people might find interesting. You talked about how like the car companies haven't really like innovated in this kind of infotainment space, putting the things in your car that you need for like a really long time. They were, they were actually kind of forced to do it because companies like Tesla and everything were like, uh, why isn't there just a large, beautiful screen in here that you can touch and do things on? Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in high school, a very good friend of mine, I'll leave his name out just in case he doesn't want his name on the podcast, but um, him and I actually set up turn by turn GPS back in 1996. And what we did was is somebody had let us borrow, it was, I think it was called like an Eagle GPS unit or something. Mm -hmm. We mounted it on top of his car. We took a monochrome monitor, (laughs) ran it to a portable machine. It wasn't even a laptop. It was a portable machine in the backseat of the car. And we loaded this mapping software on there that had the ability to bring up a map and then it would put a little triangle wherever you're located on the GPS. Now, this was designed for people who were like hiking and backpacking and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And we thought, well, what would happen if we did that and then drove around with it? And we actually drove around the city and it was drawing this map and putting these little triangles all over the map as we were driving. Not accurate at all in the sense that like (laughs) it wasn't showing like every little street, but every time we came to a major intersection, it would update. And it was so long ago, but we were able to hack that and figure it out within a couple of hours of just having this idea, right? Mm -hmm. You know, flash forward, you know, the iPhone comes out. I mean, geez, what is that? Like 96, 2006, 2016. I mean, you're looking like 20 years later, it's finally fully worked out inside of your car, right? Like it shows you how technology moves really, really fast, but production quality technology that scales Mm -hmm. takes a lot of time to happen. And that's why when I keep hearing people say like, oh, self-driving cars will be here tomorrow. It's like they're working on it and they're doing an amazing job at working on it, but it's not here yet for a very particular reason because scaling it like that is challenging. Yeah. And it brings up an excellent point. So you mentioned the the question of like time and when is this going to happen? And then you also brought up things like charging infrastructure and batteries and things like that. And uh, one of the things I'll point out is those are absolutely linked to each other. So um, the availability of batteries and the charging infrastructure is absolutely kind of a limiter on how quickly this um, transition can happen. And uh, there's also the reality that uh, for self-driving cars, the technology for it exists and it can be very successful. What is missing right now is just data. So for these AI systems to really know how to drive on the road, they kind of have to get trained. They have to learn. They have to get out on the road and experience all the different conditions that they might uh, experience once they are live to the consumer so that they know what to do with them, right? So you think back as a human being to what it was like to learn to drive. The first time you drove in the snow, the first time you drove in the rain, the first time you encountered some crazy driver who was drunk and weaving all over the place, you had to learn what to do in in response to that. And the same thing is true with the AI AI systems. Uh, And the only way for them to to really learn is for these testing systems to get out there. Um, And we have them now where where, um, Tesla and and Google and some of these other companies are taking their self-driving vehicles and putting them on the road and helping them to learn what to do in different situations. And it needs to happen at a much larger scale. They need to encounter all of the different things that they might encounter while they're driving a person around in order to to learn how to react to that. And then once that's complete, then the system will be a little bit more complete. The other challenge, and this is related to just manufacturing capacity, when it comes to batteries, when it comes to electronics, when it comes to AI, 
is there are there are some uh, some limitations in from a production standpoint because a lot of this a lot of these kinds of vehicles and these kinds of uh, computer systems from a hardware perspective they require what are called rare earth elements. And the rare earth elements, they're, they're difficult to extract because they're not, they're not really, they don't show up in the earth like you see like seams of iron or, or gold or copper. They're, they show up much more distributed throughout the, the surface strata and, and, um, the, the portion of the earth. So it's requires usually some very, uh, expensive, and proprietary technologies in order to extract them and refine them so that you can use them in producing their electronics. Another issue is that right now, China has almost completely cornered the market on these rare earth elements. So societally, economically, the other countries and, and companies of the world are looking for alternative sources from them. Um, everybody's getting them from China for now, and that's that's fine, and it's working. In order to really meet the demand of replacing all of the cars with electronic vehicles that are able to self-drive, we need much more, much more of these rare earth elements. And that could be either found throughout the different portions of the earth or, and this is why I think Elon Musk and uh, other investors are really interested in getting off world to places like Mars is that it's much easier to operate uh, mining operations on non-populated planet like Mars than it would be here on Earth or on some kind of a uh, meteorite or asteroid somewhere that is that doesn't have any kind of regulation that you need to worry about or anybody living nearby. Yeah, and and just to be clear for everyone who's who's listening who's not familiar with this. Um, I mean, this is like bleeding edge kind of technology and and stuff that Demetrius is talking about. It's the idea that we can actually launch, let's say, a robot or something like that. It can land on uh, a meteor and it can extract elements <clears throat> from it and then bring it back to Earth. It's something that that, that I've been hearing about for. I don't know about ten years or so, and they're kind of working on the technology to figure this out. Um, Mar- the Mars one is more realistic because we've already sent things to Mars, and people are talking about this stuff. But I've also been hearing more about people saying like, "Oh, how do we get something to land onto a meteor, and then we can grab stuff from it and bring it back to Earth?" And it's very bleeding edge technology of of rocket science to kind of figure out how to do that. But I I, I hear what you're saying, and you had sent me these very dense articles <laughs> a few days ago about rare earth elements. And one of the things that I, I got from it was that there's a recycling process, which is also going on. Ashley Vance from Bloomberg Business, he has this show called Hello World. And, and his first episode from the season is, is pretty amazing. And it, and it basically talks about a former Tesla person who is in Nevada. And one of the things that he's doing with his new company is actually taking all these old batteries and everything from our phones and all this other uh, different places, uh, Mm -hmm. Fitbits and you name it. And then trying to like break apart that stuff and pull out these elements that you're talking about um, and then recycle them so that we can have a process for basically creating more and more batteries and but not also taking those old batteries and just dumping them into the earth or having them as a one-time use thing but creating a cycle that's you know safe and clean Mm -hmm. for the environment the other thing i wanted to talk about before we kind of come to the end of this particular podcast is something that you and i are very experienced in which is user experience is that a lot of people that i talk to have come up with some pretty fun and exciting ideas around the ux of self-driving cars Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have these electric cars and then they're going to become self-driving. And what that actually does is it completely changes the behavior of us. Because if I'm not getting up in the morning, getting in my car and driving myself to work every day, then what exactly am I doing with that extra time? Now, Mm -hmm. I want to kind of roll it back for a second and say, right now, because of everything that's been going on in the world, like I don't drive that much anymore. So basically what I do is I park my car, it sits there and I use it like once a week. (laughs) But in the future, when things really, really open up, um, hopefully in the next six months or so, I'll get back to driving a lot more. Well, I imagine in a scenario where I have a self-driving car, I'm in the car, I have to do, I could do something with that time. Now, yeah, you can sit there and play on your phone. But some of the concepts that I saw from, from friends, um, as we were all joking around talking about this was, well, could a van show up 
and I can basically work in the back of the van. Like it just has all my equipment in there. And as it's driving, I'm just working and as if I'm sitting in my home office. Another one that I saw was, well, what if a van showed up and it had a bunch of uh, Pelotons in there? Can I work out on the way to my office while the car is driving? What do you see? What what are the kind of the fun ideas that are coming out of your mind from a UX perspective um, that might give us that time back and also maybe even make us either have more fun or be productive? Well, I mean, the first thing to look at is what are people doing now when they're being driven around by somebody else, right? So like you said, they're they're playing around on their phone. They uh, they might be reading. They might be listening to music. They might be surfing social media. A lot of uh, the people who, when they're on their their commute buses in, in the Bay Area, like if they're if they're taking their, their Google bus from San Francisco to Mountain View, a lot of times they're on their they're on that bus. They're having meetings. They're working. Um, I think that's definitely a possibility. It, the reality is, it can be anything that we do when we're not on a vehicle. So you could be working out. You could be watching movies. You could be playing video games. Uh, you could be productive and and um, doing some some kind of work. You could be shopping remotely. You sh- could be setting things up for dinner. So when you get home, your groceries are sitting there waiting for you. Uh, there's a variety of things you can do. One of the things that um, people who are in the industry that we have to think about and keep in mind is there are certain human factor limitations to, you know, taking those kinds of actions when you're moving in a vehicle, right? So, oh yeah, the first thing I thought about was vomiting. Oh I was yeah, like, you know, you you know me, I don't I don't do well looking down while yeah. a car is moving, right? I get very yeah. sick. So, so <laughs> when you said all those things, I was like, ugh. Yeah, I'm going to lay out a scenario for you, right? As somebody who gets motion sick. Now, imagine you're in the back of a van. You're sitting at a desk. Maybe you're sitting sideways or backwards to the, to the direction of movement. And now you're trying to work. So you're trying to process, read text, and then, and then type things out or something like that. It's, it can be absolutely brutal for anybody who has any form of social of uh of motion sickness so, yeah and you know the, the thing that does come to mind that really excites me is the idea that we would never be late right if you think about it if you put in your calendar oh i have a meeting at 10 a.m in palo alto and the self-driving car is to pick you up and take you to that meeting the self-driving mm-hmm. car would be calculating your time based on traffic based on everything Right, getting you at the, to that meeting at exactly ten o'clock. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, I that sounds how, pretty awesome. I, I know how punctual you are, and how important punctuality is to hey, you. I am very punctual. It's yes. very important to me that I, that you don't be late. <laughs> it is one of your defining characteristics. I hate to break it to you, Brian. I know this is very sad for you, but human beings are still going to be human beings. They're going to find a way to be late. The, uh, <laughs> you can just be late well, when your self driving car is picking you up. Yes, believe it or not. Believe it or not. The excuse I was stuck in traffic just is it's not the excuse that people make it out to be. <laughs> people are it's gonna, not going away. <laughs> it's not going away. I mean, people are gonna be like, oh, my self-driving car is here, I'll be fine. It'll wait, it it can wait for me for five minutes and now we're late, and then this vehicle's gonna be it, it it's not probably gonna drive at unsafe speeds in order to make sure that you're not late. Not to mention the fact that like I don't know how many times that some of my chronically late friends have told me that, oh, hey, I'm on my way when they are absolutely not on their way. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, totally. Yeah. I mean, no, it's fun people- to think about all this stuff, though, because, you know, if, if, if we're saying that self-driving cars are, let's say, five years out or 10 years out, mm-hmm. um, it's, right around the, it's right around the corner. And, and I, I think what I want to do now, like as we kind of wrap up this podcast, is I'd like to challenge you on something. So okay. normally we do a prediction where I'd say like, where do you think this industry is going? Right. And I, and I like doing that, but I'd like to ask you, when do you predict that you will see self-driving cars around your neighborhood in uh, Silicon Valley? Well, I already see them. So that's kind of an unfair kind of challenge. Well, I mean, so. I, I mean, I mean, we see them as like they're being tested or whatever, but I mean, for mm-hmm. real, like they're being used, like they're coming over, they're picking people up, they're taking them to their, to their office or whatever it is. Like, when do you think you're going to really see that in action? What has become my go-to move when you ask me these questions, I'm going to, I'm going to 
I'm going to change the parameters of the question in order to answer that. So for one, we're going to see much more testing. So you're going to see a lot of testing vehicles in a variety of different communities. It can't just happen in certain states and it can't just happen in certain communities. So it, it's, it needs to get out to, you know, in California, you got to get up to gold country. You got to get up to, to uh, the rural areas. You've got to face the challenges that occur there uh, in addition to, you know, just driving in ideal conditions in Arizona. So you're going to see, you're going to see that as part of the rollout. And then over the years, you're going to see um, some of the newer, especially electric vehicles, they're going to be out there next. And it's going to be kind of like the way you saw Tesla's where it was going to be the early adopters, people with a lot of money who are using it as a status symbol. You're going to see those next. And I think that, uh, I think you're going to see the testing vehicles within the next two, three years. I think you're going to see it as the status symbol within the next uh, five, eight, nine years. And then for it to really become mainstream where they, they are, it's like it is now kind of with electric vehicles where it's, it's starting to find some level of parity with legacy vehicles. Mm-hmm. I think we're looking at more like 15 years out, to be honest. Um, wow. I, I, that's a pretty, pretty far out prediction now right like like so that's the consumer space i will hedge this by saying that in the intermediate space you're going to start seeing some more autonomous delivery i think that's going to happen first because you can have vehicles out there that are much less dangerous right you can have things that are made of carbon fiber that are made to disintegrate on impact with anything that could appear in a human and you know if somebody loses uh, a you know a cart full of groceries in the process they'll just absorb that cost that I think you can start seeing in the next six, seven, eight years. I think that will will become really the norm. Passenger vehicles, I think, are going to take a little bit longer. And part of that is just because if you look at how what cars are on the road, it takes a while for for quite a while for legacy vehicles to just cycle out of the market. Right? You still have cars that are 20, 30 years old on the road. And part of, not all of that is just from nostalgia. Some of that is just economics of people saying like, look. If it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to spend money on a new car if I don't necessarily have to. And that has not, that's not always just because somebody doesn't have the money to do so. Sometimes somebody's driving around a you know a, a 58 Corvette because it's just fucking cool. It is another form of status symbol, and it's fun to drive. That's the reality of it. I, I think for those to to recycle out to to cycle out of our system, it's going to take a while. Um, and it's also going to take a while, um, speaking from a technical standpoint, for the uh, charging infrastructure, for the battery infrastructure, for rare earth elements, for AI, for all these things to kind of get up to speed in order to yeah. meet kind of the demand of, you know, getting hundreds of millions of Americans on the road in these kinds of vehicles. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I mean, that's a really... That's a really interesting prediction. I mean, I, I think I would speed it up a little bit just looking at how quickly technology tends to evolve once we kind of figure out the formula, so to speak. Um, so I was just thinking in my mind, like based on what I'm reading and kind of what I'm seeing is that the kind of passenger vehicle uh, autonomous thing would kind of be pretty mainstream in in the major cities by 2030. So about 10 years from yeah. now. Well, in I the major cities, I think so, especially within the Bay Area, um, probably LA, probably New York. If you're talking about... You know, a city like Detroit, for example, where they are really tied to just culturally their legacy vehicles. I, I think it takes a, a while longer for that to kind of get there, especially you're talking about, you know, Midwest where they're tied to trucks and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and they, a lot of times, will have family heritage of Chevy trucks, Dodge trucks, Ford trucks. They might be slower to, to cycle out. And I'm keeping in mind that, like, when, when you and I go to CES, uh, because we're working on so many of these products, it's it's hard to get excited because every it feels like we stepped into five years ago, right? Yep. It's these are all new products to most of the consumers in the world, but for us, this is all old technology. So yeah, when you see it every day and you it's right in front of your face constantly, and I'm not talking about working on it, I'm talking about just people talking about it and like mm-hmm. every you know testing, like everyone yeah. wants to test all their products out with us locally, 
so you see a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And you're right. You go to CES and you see the, the autonomous vehicles and all this kind of stuff. And for the world, they're like, wow, that's kind of what's happening. And we're like, okay, yeah, that's been going on for a little while now. And this is kind of the more finished prototype that you have. Yeah. It's just the reality. Technologically, we're a hundred percent there now. I mean, technologically, we're there right now. We've been there for a couple of years. It's just kind of economically and societally, we'll just take a little bit longer to get there. Absolutely. So with that said, uh, I think today's a wrap on our episode about uh, electric and autonomous vehicles. And that was super fun. Um, So we will see everybody next week. Thank you very much. Bye.